I'm amazed at how resilient the people are, how adaptable the, lo- the, the people of Sumatra is and, and how friendly they are. Given the past traumas that they have experienced, given the conflict that they have survived, given the tsunami and different level of pain that they have went through, they still have a lot of smiles on their face. They still see life in in ways that is optimistic. The land of Sumatra faces a great many challenges from illegal logging, poaching, government corruption, infrastructure projects, the dwindling habitat for iconic species like the Sumatran rhino, elephant, orangutan, and tiger, and social inequity faced by indigenous communities and women seeking to protect and preserve the beautiful and biodiverse landscape they depend upon to survive. Many of these topics covered can be fairly described as daunting, but there are activists working on the ground daily who want the world to know there is hope for change and a pathway forward if action is taken now. My name is Mike DiGirolamo your host for Manga Bay Explorers, a special podcast series from MangaBay.com's global team, where I speak with experts from the field working to protect the critically threatened forests and animals of Sumatra. Join me for this final episode in the 10-part series that has covered the unique beauty and key issues of the land of Sumatra. This week, I spoke with two notable environmental activists and conservationists, Farwiza Farhan, chairperson and co-founder of Yasan Haka, an influential local NGO in Bond Aceh and Bunki Nanda Pratama, a youth educator and environmental activist, co-founder of the Sumatra Camera Trap Project and founder of the Jungle Library Project. I spoke with these two activists about their efforts on the ground, their perspective of the effectiveness of current conservation, what they are hopeful for, their biggest challenges, how they feel their efforts can be better supported, and what role citizens locally and globally have to play in protecting and revitalizing the lands and economy for the animals and people of Sumatra. From the educational projects that Punky and his team engage in, in areas of human-wildlife conflict, to Farwiza's work providing paralegal training to locals in the Loser ecosystem and a women-led ranger team in the province of Aceh, to discussing the role the media has to play in sharing the hope and positive messaging that Punky feels is necessary to draw in more support. We covered what activists feel are the most important next steps to bringing about environmental and social change that is needed to save the one-of-a-kind landscape of Sumatra and those whose very lives depend on it. My name is Punky Nanda Pratama, and um, I'm actually working in a conservation. Maybe you can call me like conservationist, but um, I specifically is an environment educator, but I'm also doing another conservation work. I cannot describe my, my own self, but um, I'm just a person that wants to help by my hand to help nature. That's it. Because uh, for me, uh, the words like conservation is very heavy for me. Like uh, people call me conservationist, but I'm not. <laughs> because uh, I, cannot, I cannot describe my own self. While Punky does not describe himself as a conservationist, he is undeniably an educator on the importance on conserving the forests of Sumatra. And he believes the primary way to achieve this is through educating children who he largely sees as the hope for conservation in the future. Actually, a um, lot of uh, problems here. And then conservation is uh, the have a lot of problems, especially in Sumatra. And the key to protect nature is uh, education, to educate the local people to more aware about the nature and wildlife, because uh, lots of... Uh, lots of uh, wrong mindset about uh, nature happening here and i always like a uh, seeing in my face and then i seeing the young generation is uh, more aware and they're more open-minded is like give me a hope that's why i'm trying to educate a young generation with environment education since uh, five years ago and it's give me lots of hopes and I trying to keep continuing to doing environment education. One of Punky's current efforts is the Jungle Library Project, which performs education to children in areas of high human wildlife conflict, such as the Kerinci Sublat National Park 
and Izao Izao Wildlife Preserve. Yeah, actually, Jungle Library Project is、uh, environment education. We doing it in the border of conservation area. Is、uh, like、um, in the Kenichi Sublime National Park in South Sumatra, and also in the border of Isau Isau Wildlife Reserve. I'm working in the two different conservation area in the border, and I'm teaching、uh, more about maybe since five years ago, like、uh, over a thousand kids. Since 2016, and then、um, we're trying to choose the area with the highly、uh, problems like illegal logging and also human wildlife conflict. We're trying to get there, and then the environment education is trying to raise awareness and change the mindset of、uh, wildlife and also the nature itself. Punky mainly teaches five focus areas that he is noticing is making a difference in the outlook and awareness of the children. And recently, his efforts are garnering additional funding. Lots of kids that、um, changing their mindset, and sometimes like it show to me, like、uh, they are more I don't know. It's like more aware than the parents, and、um, I'm focusing in five lessons. Is、uh, because I'm I'm making a I'm making like syllabus for the lesson, focusing on、uh, forest and then river, and then、uh, protected and endangered species of animals and flora, and then a plastic pollution and solution, and the last one is a human wildlife conflict. This of five lesson is the main problems in South Sumatra, the main conservation pro- problem in South Sumatra. That's why I'm trying to make a syllabus and lesson like on point to solve and raise awareness in the five problems in that's happening in South Sumatra. And I'm very grateful. Like、uh, this year, we have a funding that they. I'm finally after three years. I'm waiting for. And my book on the for conservation is published, and、uh, hopefully after this pandemic gone, we will like、uh, yeah trying to share to the kids、uh, in the border of a、uh, of a、uh, conservation area. While Punky selected areas like Kerinci Sublat to teach in precisely because they experience high illegal logging and wildlife conflict, he says the incidents of these are trending down since he began teaching there. Kerinci Sublime National Park.、Um, in my experience and my time spending a lot of time there, like、uh, yeah, lots of、uh, problem with the、uh, poaching activities and also illegal logging activities there. But I'm very grateful. Like、uh, the trend is、uh, going down. Not like、uh, for the first time. I'm on 2016. I'm getting there, and shock me. And I'm very grateful. Like、uh, right now, our government is like a very strict form with、uh, like、uh, environment issues. The trend is like、uh, yeah, slowly like a slow down.、Uh, there is like a two hypotheses for me. One, the species is very rare because yeah, in the last time, like everything just get poached and the species very rare, and then like a very hard、uh, people to find. And the second, because、uh, yeah, lots of right now our government is very strict with with the environment issues like illegal logger or poacher. It's like easily sent to the jail. Yeah, there is like a slow down trend of、uh, yeah illegal activities inside of conservation area, including national park. Punky relayed to be a complicated social landscape to navigate, where conservation education sometimes comes into conflict with villagers who are hunting endangered species to feed their families. Since I'm living with the villagers, that's give me more perspective. Like I'm a person that doing conservationist conservation, and then some people like、uh, just、uh, saying in the one direction. Like we need to see from another perspective to like solve the problems, and then because I'm living with the villagers. Like why they go into the jungle to poach, or why they go into the jungle to cutting down the trees, is because economy. And then 
not all villages have uh, like a good living. They mostly just depend on the like plantation, depend on like unstable work. And I say, like I'm working with the kids and kids told me, and they like my own spy. And they told me like my parents, like my dad bringing a sunbed to the home and we eat together. Like, but the kids told me like, um, my dad will going to the jail because we eating a sun bear or are my dad is uh, going to the jail because uh, he killed uh, like porcupine or pangolins and they more aware but I don't have a uh, power to stop but I just uh, can uh, raise awareness sometime their parents cro- confront me because I tell it to the truth to the kids and the kids pass the information to the parents and the parents going to me and they told me like, why are you trying to like uh, stop me to eating that? Do you want to feed my family? I have no idea about that. But the only things that I cannot do is like raise awareness to them like, uh, Please stop eating endangered or selling endangered species because not only you ruin yourself and you ruin your family, when the police forest notice you doing illegal things, you will like easily go into the jail. Punky is quick to note, however, that simply telling people to stop illegal activities is not enough, but that solutions and alternatives to address economic concerns must be provided. It's been like uh, five years. I'm working with the conservation agency. We have uh, two different work. I'm focusing in the young generation and then conservation agency of South Sumatra focusing in old generation in a different way. And we're working together to yeah, raise awareness and also ch- change the man- mindset of the local people. And for us, not only we trying to stop, like a telling, please stop that, but we need to give them solution to make them not entering the uh, conservation area and doing illegal things. It's very important because even for me, when the people still hungry, they will still go into the jungle to doing illegal things when they have no source or like... Uh, education or um, like ability to doing another job it's like a very complex even here in the indonesia in developing country you cannot easily blaming people when you are on their position and then they family hungry and the father can provide money and they just choose an illegal thing they most of them misunderstand they doing illegal things and there, they are terrorists doing illegal things. Because of the complicated web of economic factors, Punky feels more educational outreach, and particularly that of positive messaging, is needed to bring in the broader general public to translate into real-world impact. He says consistent focus on the negative aspects of conservation in Indonesia is hindering funding efforts for NGOs and other organizations due to the perceived lack of hope in how much difference funding would make. I always like a saying in the YouTube or in the news or in the radios, like always like a talking of bad things about Indonesian conservation. And lots of people always like a talking about the bad things like a wildfire, palm oil, cutting down the trees or anything make conservation like a make conservation work in Indonesia is getting worse because the funding not trust us like me working here um, as Indonesian is very hard to get a funding from another country because they don't trust us they always like asking like your government corrupt when we fund you do do your government is trustworthy and they think twice to help us out. And that's why we need to, like, uh, like I hope that media, like, everything, like, news, like, TV, like, make a balance, like, a balanced story 
to like, uh, yeah, posing, like sometimes we kind of posing a bad thing to make people think like we need to act to solve this. But also we need to posing on the good things too, to give people hope because it's in my experience, like uh, lots of conservation agency in Indonesia, even like uh, during this pandemic time, is a uh, hit hurt by a lot of things. And most of them like collapse because uh, we are yeah, depending on uh, funding from another country. When the country not believing Indonesian again, they just uh, take it off the fund and then conservation never done here. That's why like, uh, yeah, I just want to sing in the future, like uh, the news is balanced, just like a bad and good is like in balance time to make uh, people aware and make a people, give a people hope to doing conservation together like that. Punky and his team currently are working on a project called the Flora Conservation Act, where they are creating a buffer zone of protected flora around Karinchi Sublat National Park to prevent the extinction of endangered endemic species. They were responsible for building the first greenhouse in Karinchi Sublat. He described to me a shockingly large demand of plants and flowers brought on by COVID-19, which has been driving the hunting of these endemic plants in Southeast Asia and in Sumatra in particular. We think like a people not focusing on the plants and then like no one focusing like on the, on the field. We still have a botanical garden. They have a part to saving species like a flora species across the country. But we're trying to act on the field, on the South Sumatra. At least we can protect a South Sumatra native species. And then on 2017, we're trying to make a pilot project and we, we built the first uh, greenhouse in, in the border of uh, Krinjis Black National Park. And then we just have found it, like tons of uh, endangered species sell online, like across the, even like across the nation and know the country. Orchids, he noted, were highly in demand. And the, the orchid is like a, the sexiest <laughs> family of plants that people love it and people like tons of collector even like uh, in indonesia and outside the country want some of certain species in sumatra and sumatra is like uh, i don't know heaven of orchids but have a lot of problems and some of species endemic and then you cannot find anywhere else on earth except in Sumatra. That's why make a, like a lots of collector trying to like a contacting of people like a, we call a plant hunter. Like every single place have a plant hunter and a plant hunter like can do anything to get a plant even in the protected area. And since pandemic hit, maybe you notice it like a plant trend is a rising up like everybody want a, like a jungle house like everybody ordering plants across the world and southeast asia is a home of uh, exotic plants lots of order from europe uk us coming to indonesia but the lack of the education here make a people not like a trying to breed or have a sustainability to like a breeding pro like a like a breed them in the house or like that but because of lots of demands on a yeah on earth and then a people trying to make a quick money going to the uh, protected area and then like a, yeah just harvest in the world very very i don't know it's like a very sad to see that and uh, very worried, like uh, people will extinct locally. Like we worry it locally extinct. He stresses the importance and the fragility of microhabitats, which are crucial to the survival of these orchids, which is why Punky has a five person team that goes out to rescue them from the wild, rehabilitate them, and place them in protected areas where they won't be hunted. Orchids have a specific ecosystem to live. Orchids need the micro habitats. When 
the microhabitats gone, the orchids gone. And that's why like uh, we need to trying to to rescuing a flora in unprotected area and rescuing flora in destroyed area. We focusing on to the area. We have a team with conservation agency, like a five people. And then there is like a, like we have a specific, like a specific person that have a lot of ability, like focusing to climb up, to reaching out the hardest place to get uh, orchids and uh, people that can identify it. And then uh, people can uh, transport it and then a uh, post rescue it, bring the orchid to the uh, rehabilitation house, like a greenhouse. We like uh, rehabilitate and we trying in the next step we will like propagate them and the like the goals we will like bring them back to the world but we will choose a protected area to place them in the protected area to make sure they are thrive and also like it can i don't know it's like a, yeah growing by themselves in the protected area He brought up two species of orchids in particular that, by law, are not supposed to be transported anywhere without a permit, but are being traded, as he mentions, like vegetables. In my knowledge, slipper orchids is protected by law in Indonesia and protected by law internationally. And then there is like one species, is a called um, Super uh, Papiopedilum super beans is uh, endemic to Sumatra. Um, is uh, with the status is critically endangered, and then appendix one in Citus. It means like uh, this species cannot go anywhere else without permit, like even like uh, nationally. But people here selling like a vegetable. Like you selling carrot, they take from the jungle and selling online and they bring to another island and bring to another country. Another flower that Punky is working to protect is the mammoth-sized Rafflesia arnoldi, which is quite literally the largest flower in the world, yet ironically very fragile. The biggest that Punky has seen was 1.2 meters in diameter. Rafflesia is my my favorite my favorite plant, and then like the Rafflesia is a parasitic obligate, or when the hosts die, the Rafflesia die. That's why when we want to conserve the Rafflesia, we need to protect the host. And the specific plant host on Rafflesia is called Tetrastigma, and Tetra stigma can uh, like a uh, growing in in certain uh, island like um, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, and some of the Southeast Asian country. Some time ago, Punky was photographed next to one, which shows the striking size of the flower compared to himself. He commented that they can get so big that you could theoretically fit your head inside of them. And on the picture, in my picture, is an endemic species from Sumatra. It's called a uh, the biggest Rafflesia on earth is a call as a, it's called um, Rafflesia arnoldi, or maybe you can say Rafflesia arnoldii, but I call it Rafflesia arnoldi. I found that in the Bengkulu province. It's like very close with South Sumatra, but we are very grateful. In uh, my workplace with the conservation agency that managed by conservation agency, we found a hill of Rafflesia. It's like Rafflesia heaven. There is like a 70, 17 bulb. We call it bulb like, um, because um, it looks like a bulb, but no. And we saw like a 17, like across the hill. There is like a one hill, only Rafflesia. And I'm very grateful the conservation agency trying to save the area because of uh, Rafflesia is very fragile. Even when you touch it, you cannot damage the flower. Like, you can't do anything. Like, you cannot disturbing them. Even, like, uh, when you're just uh, walking around the roots, because uh, 
tetra stigma like a tetra stigma have a, like a long roots and like a finding things and when you like uh, stepping on the roots like there is like a pimple on the roots of rafflesia and you step it you will like uh, make them die for species uh, rafflesia arnoldi you can only see in sumatra and they huge like super huge the biggest one i've seen in a while is a 1.2 meters diameter it's like huge like you can put your head inside a flower in addition to protecting flora punki has assembled the sumatra camera trap project which focuses on capturing footage in the isau isau wildlife reserve including the sumatran tiger malayan tapir sun bear and sunda clouded leopard so far punki says the project has generated substantial footage in unexpected areas which has given him hope both for future funding and to raise awareness on the importance of the reserve. Additionally, he uses the footage from these camera traps to teach children who live on the border of the reserve. I met a person that want to help me out. I met them online with a person named Anthony Hearn. He is from England. Even like in day 1, he don't know me, but he trust me and a week after he's sending me camera trap and then i'm just taken aback like a uh, how come you trust me we just a uh, meeting online and then why you want to helping me out you need to know me deeply before you sending to camera trap and he told me like uh, i just want to help you out and then the camera trap come in you know that people here even me crying like we never expected we have the technology to capturing like a uh, wildlife activities in the in the area because it's very expensive to buy a camera trap on that time and most of them like imported and i'm very grateful like anthony give us um, the camera trap and then the sumatra camera trap project is born on the same year and then since uh since 2018 and right now we just are finding tons of endangered species and protected species of in Isawisa Wildlife Reserve and i'm very grateful after we yeah we know we share and we trying to raise awareness for important uh Isawisa Wildlife Reserve to the public even nationally and internationally like right now we very grateful we got so much fun to more like uh, to make a uh, lots of conservation um activities in isau isau that's the goals that we want because before that is uh, even like uh, no one want to work in isau isau people trying to choose the area with the flag species like there is a rhino elephants or tiger like a sexiest species they were like a trying to find the area with that but it's how it's how it's like an empty room like no one know and people don't notice it like people don't care but i'm very grateful with the camera trap we can show how like a whole rich is how it's how and i'm also using the camera trap uh, now footage to teaching a kids uh, in the border of is how it's how to make them understand like a uh, your jungle have a tons of species i believe that the world is not like a not um uh, stuck the world will like uh, yeah going better and better and that's why like uh, i've never been tired to doing conservation education because i i i seeing a lot of hopes in in the young generation yeah at least we yeah just a uh, working together to solve the problem in a, even like in different way in reflecting on the problems i've covered thus far in this series i learned a lot from punky from the perspective of an activist he highlighted the complicated balance of covering the problems sumatra is facing and the perceived hopelessness this might communicate to potential funders and allies of restoration and protection efforts Punky's message is not one of ignoring these highly complex issues, but of making sure we are giving potential allies enough hope that they join the fight in saving this land. We need to share like a positive thing 
and like uh, bring the hope to everyone, even like around us, to make a hope in conservation because it's very important right now. It's like a, we just are seeing bad news and anything make a yeah make a people like hopeless in conservation. Like we know destruction is in everywhere. We can avoid it. We can resist it. But we should make a better place with like a sharing a good thing and make everything balanced and a good and bad. Because like in, in my experience that working in a conservation in Indonesia is very hard. When uh, people don't trust me to doing this work, I can do nothing. When like a people only like, sounding like a bad things, like people will be like a, just a thing when they just a thing in in one perspective is ruining people that work in a conservation across the country in Indonesia. Because uh, I just uh, want to tell you like Indonesian doing conservation in even in a different way. Not only myself. I'm just a uh, I'm going to the another island. There is like a young man trying to planting mangroves. There is like an old man trying to reforest um, like a bold hill with the plants. He planting every single day and never reach on the on the public. But uh, like the opinion and the, the news, bad news is like uh, either cover it a good thing. And then, like, uh, yeah, just yeah, make uh, people that working in a conservation in Indonesia give a difficult things, and that's why when you seeing my, I don't know my Facebook, I've never I've never showing like the bad things because people understand by themselves. That's I need to do is like a uh, give the people hope. Like we still we still are doing our effort to protect uh, our nature. One activist whose work has given hope and inspired many internationally is that of Farwiza Farhan, who runs an internationally recognized NGO in Aceh, driving unique solutions to many deforestation, economic, and social issues faced in the Loser ecosystem. Uh, my name is Farwiza Farhan. I usually go by Wiza. I work for an organization called Forest, Nature, and Environment Aceh. The focus of our work is to conserve, protect, and restore the loiser ecosystem in Sumatra. And we are doing that to advocacy and campaign, as well as strengthening the voice of local community in decision-making pertaining to land and livelihood. Wiza currently is tackling problems posed by the Aceh Provincial Spatial Plan, which is an infrastructure and development plan devised by the provincial government. However, it does not recognize the Loser ecosystem, which Wiza has been fighting to protect. Essentially, a spatial plan is the blueprint of development. Anywhere in the world, especially if you live in the developed country, you know areas where you are allowed to build houses, areas where you are allowed to build industrial um, areas. And it's the same thing with Indonesia. Um, essentially, when we look at Aceh and its spatial plan, it is the document that determines which areas will be protected, which areas could be exploited, which areas could be developed, in a sense. And the problem with the Aceh spatial plan at the moment, that it, it doesn't acknowledge the existence of the Loiser ecosystem as an area that is somewhat protected. And what we're trying to do is to include the protection of the Loiser ecosystem back into the regulation that protected in the first place. One way that WISA achieves protection is through encouraging citizens to participate in legal action through citizen lawsuits, such as one carried out asking the Aceh provincial government to simply include the Loiser ecosystem in their spatial plan. Essentially, a citizen lawsuit is um, an action that citizens could take asking the government to, Im- to do its job, to implement the law the way it is. Um, so what happened in the process of Aceh's spatial plan is it was conceived in somewhat in secret. Um, it did not involve the broader group of people that will be impacted. And the process, uh, not only it was not inclusive, when the local community demand to see the law, demand to see the document, the government forbid them from doing so. 
once the document become public, once it was issued and it become public, uh, there's still a layer of accountability that the government need to meet, which is an approval from central government. The central government have provided a review and the review essentially one of the most important point in the review is the inclusion of the loiser ecosystem. The loiser ecosystem need to be included as areas that is protected in the special plan. Um, and the Aceh government did not implement this review as is. So what we're trying to do with the citizen lawsuit is asking the government just to include the loiser ecosystem as instructed by the central government. And the reason why we choose this pathway is, first of all, citizens do have a say in special planning law. However, often this right is not fully utilized. Often this right is not um, fully implemented. And engaging in these lawsuits are one of the pathway to get the citizen to be active in engaging in decision making. One such case involved the owners of a plantation concession inside the Loser ecosystem, the first of its kind. The lawsuit took years, but resulted in tens of millions of dollars in fines. It was a landmark achievement that Wiza hopes spurs more action in the future. Yeah, that's a really interesting case that you mentioned, because, I mean, not only um, that the number is impressive, $36 million, but also the circumstances on how it happened uh, is unusual. It's unprecedented. Um, some years ago, forest fires happened in Indonesia for many years, and this is something that we know quite well. And for years, anytime there's forest fires and anytime there's somebody that needs to take uh, accountability over it, often the responsibility is handed to people who lit the fire. Essentially, those folks on the ground um, who are doing the rough job of being a plantation worker. A whole lot of these fires historically happened within company properties, within companies' concession. But the company itself was never been made accountable for the fire that they have caused. Um, in 2012, in 2013, large swath of forest fires happened in the Loiser ecosystem in the Tripa Pit Swamp. Some of the companies engaging in perpetrating this fire uh, suddenly have to face the kind of consequences they never did before. The government, with support from a broad number of civil society, sued the company for the environmental damages that they have caused by, by using fire to clear land. And the lawsuit take a really long time. It was years of fighting. It was years of uh, proving the case in court. And it was years of campaigning. But when the judges announced that the company uh, forced to pay fines and restoration costs of up to $36 million, it, it was the first of its kind in Indonesia. It was the pathway of a civil lawsuit instead of criminal ones. But at the same time, there was a parallel case that was ongoing that forced the company director and its operational manager uh, to spend jail time. Haka provides paralegal training to local communities, both to let them know their rights and potential legal and policy avenues to protect those rights. And villagers have expressed desire to manage their own forests, and this inspired Wiza to research how to get villagers to apply for forest protection permits so that they can have a say, but also the authority to decide what happens in their village and forests. You see, the way I see it as sometimes in the battle between conservation and land exploitation, local community who inhabits the land become the victim. They lose their access to places that give them livelihood um, and lose their right towards those areas. And it's unfair either way. I, I don't think, um, I don't personally see conservation should be acting like uh, some kind of colonial power in that sense. Um, so social forestry is a great initiative um, if it's managed right. Because not only we think about the human that inhabit the land, we also think about the wildlife that depend on that habitat 
on the same land. The idea of social forestry that we're trying to champion and move for and support and move forward with is the idea how could conservation supports development in one landscape. Uh, so social forestry, uh, especially in the case of Hutan Desa or village forest, is quite small in scale. It's only a few thousand hectares compared to the large landscape of the Loisel ecosystem, 2.6 million hectares. And it gives the title for the local community living in the area, uh, the ability to manage their forest. Because in the past, even if this local community want to protect their forest for prevention of natural disaster, they're not allowed to. Um, so this title gives them the ability to do that. But at the same time, they could also develop their own plan on how they could manage this forest sustainably. So taking an example of a social forestry project um, in Damaran Baru, in Bernal Maria, there is a group of women that initially participate in our paralegal training years ago. And through this process, they learn about their rights um, and their uh, responsibility in the area. They learn about what they are entitled to as community members. They learn about their potential role in pushing for policy improvement. And in that process, they express their desire to protect the forest because they know that in the past, when deforestation happened, they are dealing with the consequences, flash flood and landslides occurred quite regularly in the area. So once they um, express that desire, we brainstorm with them, we sit with them, and we discuss the possibility of obtaining a village forest permit for the women in that area. This is a woman-led initiative. And this is absolutely impressive because they are mothers. Um, they have a very simple livelihood, but they are learning so much about the regulations and, and they have such a strong desire and they know what to do. They, they claim that protecting forests for us is protecting our water resources. Protecting forests for us is protecting our livelihood. So these are the group of women who gain the permit and eventually decide that their village forests uh, would become resources for their income. They develop mechanism um, such as forest, uh, public involvement in, in forest uh, restoration, as well as turning their village into an eco-village. Wiesa commented that the difficulty of obtaining the permits, which is not necessarily a simple process, isn't as big of an issue as gaining support to help maintain the forest in the decades that follow, stressing the importance of funding in this endeavor. It's relatively easy. It depends on the lens that you used to look at it. And of course, uh, it's quite a long process to obtain these permits. What's more difficult is the long-term management of this forest. Because in reality, oftentimes, um, some organization have the intention to support community to obtain forest permits, but often the project end there. And that's not sustainable because what would, what would you do if you give uh, a group of communities, uh, essentially a concession that lasted 35 years without really supporting them in the process to manage those forests. And I see our role um, to play, you know, the, the support to link up those communities with a broader market, for example. The local community in Damaran Baru have begun producing uh, honey, forest honey, which could be sold to the outside market, which make conservation more attractive for the local community in the area. So supporting this sustainable economic development that would then bridge them to the future where forest conservation is something that commonly and jointly agreed towards um, in the local community. Wiza elaborated on the importance of the paralegal training that Hakka provides, highlighting the inequity that exists for those seeking redress for environmental damages. For those without political inroads, it is a more difficult situation. Hakka provides training that lets communities know what their rights are specifically, giving them a list of lawyers to contact and other resources they can utilize to protect against environmental and financial losses. In Indonesia, the relationship between 
the public and the policymaker is ties in this patronage bond. Um, so for example, if I have a problem, I would try to call my uncle who is in the parliament or I would try to look for connections with someone who is in power to help me solve my problems. And that's embedded in the society down to a very local level, to a point that sometimes for someone to access healthcare, they would need assistance from someone else who have the knowledge, the connections and the power. And this would also be implemented on the issue of environmental problems. So for example, if there is a mining company operating in a mountain and they release the toxic tailings onto the river and the local community who are consuming fish and shellfish from the river will start to get mercury poisoning, they could not um, and often would not sue the company directly. It's not quite how things work they would try to make a report to their local parliamentarian or their local head of districts and would ask for help through that mechanism. In that process for the parliamentarian or the head of district um, to be able to solve these problems, they would need to use a whole lot of social and political capital. And often they're not willing to do so. So what we, do, what we are doing with the paralegal training is to give those folks on the ground the tools and the knowledge to know what is their right and what they can do in case of something like this. At the same time, in Indonesia, at least up until last year when the government issued the omnibus law, local community have a direct right to have a say in decision-making. However, this right is often underutilized. When a, when a company moves in and about to exploit a large block of land, they are required to uh, issue, not issue, to, to run a study on environmental impact assessment. Part of that environmental impact assessment is the free prior informed consent by the local community. These documents are often so thick, about 300 pages plus, um, very complex, and even those who are educated might not be able to comprehend the content and the risk that come with the issuance of this document, let alone local community that have other priorities in their mind. So the paralegal legal training essentially are providing these communities with a brief of what their rights are included within the law, as well as a tool on how to deal with problems like this. They, they were given a number of lawyers that they could contact. They were given a sort of like a, a report card on what they could do if something like this happened on their land. This is essentially a process to give the power back to people who are impacted, to give the power back into those who are on the ground, to give the power back to those who are dependent on the healthy um land and a healthy ecosystem. Lawsuits don't always pan out in favor of residents, but they have emboldened communities to seek other avenues, as was the case in the town of Pinning, who has taken matters into their own hands. Wiza hopes to see more villages follow suit. This is a combination of both paralegal training and the impact of citizen lawsuit that we did um, in the past few years. We lost the citizen lawsuit. After years of fighting in court, um, the judges decided that the local community is not in direct financial loss if the law is issued as is, and therefore our case was dismissed. It was really hard for us, but it was really hard for the local community who are part of this lawsuit. So one of the plaintiff, uh, Abu Kari Amanjaru, has been protecting the forest of Pinning for decades, even before I was born. And he was standing there when the judges announced that we lost the case. And he said that it's crazy how they say we don't 
have a direct financial loss over this regulation. Because in reality, when floods happen, I lose my home. When landslides happen, we lose our lands. And that process and the paralegal training that he has been participating in, participating in, encourage him to take matters back onto the ground, take matters back into their own hands. So Abu Karya Manjarum decided that they would protect the force of pinning from mining till the end of time. So he made that announcement and he garnered community support in that area to ensure that the forest in that landscape um, is protected. What we hope to achieve with this process is more of that. Another area that Wiza is achieving progress is on improving equity for women in forest management. She explained in great detail a heartrending picture of patriarchal systems that have subjugated women for years, hurting Indonesians and their families, but also the ability for more allies to protect and restore forests. Seeking to address this problem, Wiza has established a women-led ranger unit breaking through systemic barriers. However, this project too was subjected to unfair social pressures. Yes, yeah, so often the role of women in management of natural resources are diminished by society, especially in a patriarchal um, society. A few years ago, when we ran a paralegal training in this group of women in Damaran Baru, uh, it was it was not too well received. Um, it was essentially seen as um, something that was unusual but everyone sort of just let it happen just let just let the mothers have this training have this knowledge what are they going to do anyway it's a little bit of that undercurrent that is happening it's not being said but you can kind of feel it happening when we uh encourage this woman to start a woman ranger unit at the beginning, it was also, um, they were excited, but there were hesitation on the broader community whether or not women would be able to protect forests in the same way that men does. There was already in the process that these women are obtaining the permit to manage the village forest in Damaran Baru. When the Women Ranger initiatives started, um, the first question would be, how long would the women be patrolling? Will they be able to continue uh, playing their role at home, playing their domestic duties? And how would that shift the balance of power in the village? Would this woman then become too powerful? Would they become too much? for their husband, for their partners, for the village heads um, to manage and handle and control. Um, those questions were, were not expected from the perspective of a conservationist. We don't quite think um, of those you know, so social pressure and social framework, but that's the reality that we are facing on the ground. So when the group of women rangers were initiated, the first thing that needs to be um, reconciled, that we need to consult, is what are the roles that their husbands will be playing in this? So although as much as we would like to call this group an all-woman ranger, in reality, it's not. In reality, the group is led by a woman. There's a five other members of women who are running the patrol but there are also 10 men that are part of this ranger group. So there are 15 individuals, a third of them are women. It is led by a woman. Other women in the village play the role in the restoration initiatives. And the reason why it is so important to strengthen the role of women in decision-making is the fact that half of the world are women. And unless they are included in the decision-making, things that are important for them will not even be considered as part of the process in decision-making. For this woman, anytime natural disaster happen, they are the ones 
that are dealing with the impact the most. When forests are destroyed, they are the one that would have to deal with the consequences like lack of clean water. And although for me, the wildlife is one of the, my biggest incentive to protect forests, for a whole lot of people living by the forest, around the forest, in the forest, it's other ecosystem services like water and protection from disaster that play the biggest role in decision making when it comes to how forests should be managed. Wiza elaborated on the research that shows that when women are given roles in economic development, there is greater chances for an economy to grow. She explained that empowerment alone isn't enough. Men must play an active role in supporting this societal shift. There has been so many research that show that when women are given, um, are allowed or given space to play a role in economic development, there is a much, I could not remember the statistics at the moment, than the, uh, at the moment, but there are uh, much larger chances for that economy to grow on the local level and on the national level as well. Um, on questions, and how do we make this, this as a more equitable world? It is, you know, it is such an important question and something that has been campaigned on um, and discussed over, over and over um, for so many years. I personally see the role of strong women, of course, um, but also more importantly, the role of strong men to support these women and, and a creation of supportive ecosystem for the women to play their role and thrive. And the reason why I say this is I saw what happened on the ground is sometimes it's very difficult for us to start an initiative that strengthen and empower women because anytime this woman would have gone into trainings, would have gone into um, certifications or classes, they would still have to come home and face their father and face their husband and play a continuous domestic roles that they might let go for a moment when they are um, in these trainings. And their entire decision-making also consider these domestic roles, their, their role as partners, as mothers, as daughter, um, in the decision making of what they could do and what they could not do. Women that have independent stream of income, we might see them as being economically empowered. But at the same time, violence against women are still so thrive in Indonesia and all over the world. A woman that might have independent uh, economic independence might not be so independent when anything that they own is being taken away from them. So supportive community and supportive society to create supportive ecosystems for this woman to play their role and thrive are so incredibly important. Imagine not having to fight your partner all the time. Imagine not having to feel insecure about your own safety. Imagine if you could actually use that headspace to make change, to drive change. Haka has achieved many milestones over the years, and one that Wiza is particularly proud of is prompting the Indonesian government to review and audit palm oil permits, both to gain a clearer picture of land use from these concessions and to assess whether the companies are actually paying taxes. First of all, I have to I have to highlight the fact that this is not all my work. Um, a whole of this work are collaboration of many people and many organizations, and it's and it's super important for those people to be appropriately acknowledged. Uh, we have a, we would have achieved nothing if it's not for the partnership that we have on the ground. If it's not for people who supported our campaigns, those who signed our petition, um, 
And I I feel that, you know, oftentimes we we tend to take the credit all for ourselves. The work that we do focus a lot on policy and advocacy because the way we see our roles is to strengthen the regulation that protect the loiser ecosystem. A whole lot of uh, problems that happen on the ground stem from bad regulation. Um, one of the milestones and the achievement that we managed to do in the past few years that we thought was quite impossible initially was um, supporting the government to review palm oil permit in their district. The reason why we choose palm oil, not necessarily because we hate the crop, but the fact that it's so pervasive all over Sumatra. It's perhaps one of the biggest contributor of economic development, but it's also one of the biggest contributor of forest fires and uh, environmental destruction. So in one of the district in Aceh Tamiang on the east coast of the Loisar ecosystem, um, the government are encouraged to look at all of the permit of all of the palm oil permit in the area and see first of all how big is the land that the company owned um, according to the permit and how much land they actually have access to on the ground so tidying, tidying up and making sure that those two components um, are synchronized second they also look at whether or not the company pay tax. And this is an important point. A whole lot of reason for supporting palm oil development is the economic argument. But what's the point if they're not tax compliant? Third, um, where are they located? Are they located in the areas where they should be? Or are they located in areas that is allocated for forests? When would the permit um, expire? Does the company operate the way they should? Because sometimes palm oil companies own the permit without actually engaging in any activities on the ground. They just continue to trade on that permit or they use that permit to take loans um, at the bank for other reasons. So by doing this, by doing this audit along with the government, we have better clues on what are the situations on the ground? And the government also have better clues on what action to take towards tidying up this messy um, land use problem in the area. We have begun to expand that process to other districts. And we think this is one of our biggest success in addition to the woman ranger, in addition to changing the community perception um, on the ground. So if I get to highlight the work that I personally think as successful is really delivering on that uh, idea, on that uh, change that we want to, to drive, to strengthen the voice of local community in decision-making for forest and land and livelihood. Wiza grew up in Acha, and her experience is an invaluable window into a land of great beauty and diversity. When I asked Wiza to tell me what she loves the most about Sumatra, her answer was the resilience of the people that live there and the women of Acha who have been fighting to protect it. I grew up as a relatively city girl. Um, I grew up in the capital of Aceh, in Banda Aceh, and I grew up during the time of conflict uh, when civil war happened on this land. I spend a whole lot of time outside um, playing in the, you know, my childhood is filled with climbing trees and swimming in a clear river. I first fall in love with the environment through the ocean. And, and I sort of thought that, you know, this is what I want to do and what I want to become. My encounter with Sumatra has become something that, uh, a bit like, you know, you, you leave the place and then you come back and you fall in love with it all over again. I'm amazed at how resilient the people are, how adaptable the, the, the people of Sumatra is and, and how friendly they are. Given the past traumas that they have experienced, given the conflict 
that they have survived given the tsunami and different level of pain that they have went through. They still have a lot of smiles on their face. They still see life in in ways that is optimistic. Um, they still perceive their uh, existence in a in a very positive light. And I admire the people of Sumatra, but more than anything, I admire the women of Aceh. This is a province that um, that is ruled under a patriarchy, but it is also a province that historically have strong female leaders. Um, two national heroes from Aceh, both are women, Jun Yadin and Jun Mutia. And if given the opportunity, I'm not happy with the current situation, but I want things to change. I want to see the women of Aceh, the women of Sumatra, um, re-empowered back to how they were back then. For her parting words, Wiza shared some advice to women who want to work in conservation. She addressed her own experience of dealing with toxic masculinity, stressing the importance of seeking out support systems and trusted mentors, without which, she says, she might not be here today. You know, when I walked into the conservation world, I was quite naive. I just want to spend time outside. I just want to be in the forest. I want to be in the field. I didn't think that I would do what I'm doing at the moment um, as working in conservation. I know I was listening to a podcast yesterday uh, by Lonely Conservationists, and it talked about the idea of conserving the conservationists. Conservationists is a rare group of people who are passionate and dedicated to protect the environment. But often to have a job in conservation, to build a career in conservation is so difficult. And in some organization, it could be, you know, the level of toxic masculinity that's still very pervasive. Um, so as a young woman walking into conservation, I didn't expect to fight the people that I'm working with. I didn't expect to have to deal with toxic masculinity, but eventually I did. And I realized that one thing that helped me at that time is the presence of support system, the presence um, of people who trusted me, believe in me, and continue to support me and my work and stand with me on anything that I do. And for me, perhaps one of the most important thing is finding those people. Without them, I might not survive this process. Without them, I might have given up on being conservationist. But having the supportive community and really loving what you do is so helpful in pushing things forward. At the end of the interview, Wisa shared with me a thank you, citing Mongabe as a source of inspiration in her work. Her thanks is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I mean, it's really an honor to be interviewed by Mongabe. You know, I was a student when I started reading Mongabe, and I kind of felt that Mongabe have helped me to, to do more in environmentalism and conservation work. It, it's a little bit like BBC Blue Planet have helped me to become a marine biologist when I was young. <laughs> Over the course of this 10-part series, I've gained insight into deforestation drivers, the challenges that endangered wildlife face, and the economic impacts and policy roadblocks that the people of Sumatra face in protecting their swiftly disappearing biodiversity and rainforests. The disconnect between what the Indonesian government wants to achieve and what happens in reality surprised me, as did the complex problem of palm oil and pulp and paper conglomerates concealing their owners through shadow corporations. Many experts mentioned to me that solving all these problems will likely take decades and that alternate solutions by necessity will need to be pursued in order to save what we have left in time. The solutions are many. And a common theme identified is that shared collaboration from all stakeholders, ranging from private companies to local and national governments, 
NGOs, and local inhabitants themselves is going to be needed to implement these solutions, and the window of opportunity is small. Conversations with experts over the course of this series revealed a specific number that came up frequently when I asked, how much time do we have? How many years do we have left? That number was only 10. I also learned a great deal about the importance of not just shining a light on the web of deforestation drivers and economic issues, but also the successes and the solutions being implemented on the ground. Like Farwiza mentioned in the documentary film Our Mother's Land, the struggle to protect the environment may never end. But what we can do is amplify the voices of those working to protect it. I want to thank Wiza and Punky for contributing to this episode and for their continued conservation work in helping to protect and restore the lands and livelihoods of the people of Sumatra. Manga Bay Explorers is an ongoing podcast series diving into environmental stories from around the globe. Be sure to check out the previous nine episodes in this series where I cover an array of deforestation drivers and the endangered animals of Sumatra. If you enjoyed this show, please tell a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every Every two weeks, in between episodes of our flagship podcast, The Manga Bay Newscast, which you can subscribe to wherever you find podcasts, or download our new app for Apple and Android devices to gain fingertip access to all of our new shows and all our previous episodes. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters, so please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash manga bay just a dollar per month will help us offset the production costs and hosting fees keep up with all of manga bay's news from nature's frontline at manga bay.com or get updates via twitter facebook and instagram where our handle is at manga bay thank you once again and we'll be back soon with another episode of manga bay explorers